Welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 from the downtown studios of ThinkTech Hawaii in the Pioneer Plaza in beautiful Honolulu. We are a show that focuses primarily on success stories, uh, success stories related to businesses as well as individuals and the organizations that support them. We also get into topics uh, that affect businesses here in Hawaii and occasionally around the country. Uh, so that we can have a, a deeper understanding of what some of the issues are. Today's going to be one of those days where we have a guest, uh, Lloyd Lim, who has been a senior executive in the healthcare regulatory environment, Department of Insur Insurance here in Hawaii, uh, and has left. He's no longer uh, affiliated with DOI. Uh, but he's a wealth uh, or an encyclopedia, if you will, of knowledge in a lot of regulatory issues in the insurance industry and some other things that we're going to touch on during the show. So welcome, Lloyd. It's great to have you here on the show today. Thanks, Reg. It's great to be with you. I appreciate being invited. All right. It's, I think we're going to have some fun. we got a, a lot to talk about today. Now, just to, to set the groundwork a little bit, uh, you were involved with uh, the, the regulatory environment uh, in the d insurance industry here in Hawaii for uh, a number of years. Can you just give us a quick summary, uh, synopsis, if you will, of what your experience is and what you've done? Sure. Um, <clears throat> after law school, I, I started out in uh, New York in a securities firm. I was a bond lawyer. Um, in fact, I did uh, some of the dreaded mortgage-backed securities that everyone loves. Um, and then I came back to Hawaii after... Uh, the bombing of the World Trade Center, which I was in. So I came back here. Wait, I, you were in the World Trade Center? I, we, uh, we were in the World, the, we, our offices were in the World Trade Center, and so wow. I was in that, <clears throat> and I thought, well, I, I think I'll come home now. That and, was a wake-up uh, call, huh? Well, you know, <laughs> one should take lessons, I think. And um, so I came back, and I, I, uh, I, I went into the Hawaii Hurricane Relief Fund, mm -hmm. first as the uh, staff attorney, and then I became the executive director toward the end, um, and then I, I transferred over to the uh, insurance division as, uh, in the health area, and I, I was lucky to become the branch administrator there. So I did that for about a dozen years or more, and then I, uh, I, I left the BCCA, and so uh, that's kind of how I've come to be where I'm at. Well, and the dozen years you were there were pretty eventful years. I mean, I, simultaneously, I was with HMAA, which is a large uh, medical insurance company here in Hawaii. We worked together uh, on different issues, and, and of course, I was under your regulatory oversight. Um, and so I was there about, you know, the tail end of some of this, um, but it was pretty exciting times. I, we had the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare that was implemented, and there was a lot of change that was taking place in the marketplace while you were there. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate in that um, health insurance uh, was a, an area in Hawaii that was more lately regulated, and about the time I came in was when Commissioner Wayne Metcalf had uh, helped to put in the legislature, put through the rate oversight. So I, I helped to implement that, and then um, uh, shortly thereafter, um, Obamacare came about, and that was uh, a, a very large implementation and uh, with a lot of issues, and so I, I was I feel fortunate um, in a weird way because uh, when you when you have to do that kind of complicated work it it forces you to think a lot and so I, I feel fortunate. Yeah, there was you know a, a lot of thinking in those days, and then they tried to launch the uh, health connector and the exchange, mm -hmm. and there was a you know a lot of thought needed to go into that. Right. Um, yeah, and now you know you flash forward a few years, and I, although I know you've left the uh, the department. Um, Things seem to have settled down a little bit, but wait a minute, now they're talking about some more changes. I mean, what's your thoughts on, on some of these changes that's currently uh, being proposed by the Trump administration? Well, I, I think um, any legislation that is created, particularly one that is a thousand pages in length, will have to be amended. And because of partisanship, it wasn't amended. And so some amendment has to happen, and the question is what? Um, and there is, uh, the, the big problem that we face is that f forever, uh, and it's not just because of Obamacare, but there was always um, cost increases uh, mm -hmm. for decades. It's always happened, it's gonna continue to happen at a rate higher than normal inflation. And so that is, it's really the high cost and that is disabling Obamacare. And so something has to be done, but the question is what can can be done and without doing too much damage. Well, and you know, 
some of the fixes or some of the things that need to be done can't be all done at one time. They need to be probably stretched out over a period of years. So, you know, anybody who thinks that we're going to have this immediate quick fix is probably not going to be satisfied. There, it's going to take a while to for the dust to settle, so to speak. Um, in Hawaii, we had the prepaid health care law for a number of years, um, and so some of the impact wasn't as severe here as it was on the mainland. I mean, in the mainland, it was very disruptive. Over here, we had a lot of these protections already. A lot of coverage was already in place. So uh, it was you know, a positive thing, but not as, um, I guess, disruptive as it was on the mainland. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, um, <clears throat> our Prepaid Health Care Act, which is our employer mandate, is unique in the nation. Um, because we got a special exemption from ERISA. Both prepaid and ERISA came in in 1974. Um, and so we have a broad range of coverage that many, we, we already had fairly rich coverage. Uh, a lot of people were covered under it. And the other big thing I think that makes a difference between um, uh, prepaid and, and what's happened on the mainland is that Obamacare, the, dedu the, the deductibles ended up being a lot bigger for people than they thought. And so um, they feel like they don't have insurance, even though they're paying what they paid before or higher, whereas that didn't affect us because prepaid protected the uh, local population. Right, and they have some pretty specific requirements that have to be met in order for the uh, insurance companies to offer the, the policies here in Hawaii. So it's controlled, I think, a little bit better here or, or a little bit more stringently here. Um, what do you... Yeah, a lot of people don't quite understand exactly how health insurance works. I mean, is in the insurance concept itself can be fairly complicated. Um, could you, you know, and I know you've thought a lot about this over the years, but in layman's terms, can you explain a little bit about how health or medical insurance works so that maybe the typical layman can understand it? Sure. Um, we can take from, we can start with another area, something that has nothing to do, to do with insurance, which is um, in church, if in the old days, if somebody got in trouble who was a member, they might take up a collection and everyone would pitch in. Or one example is uh, the Amish. Uh, people might have seen the old movie with Harrison Ford, Witness, where if the barn burns down, everybody mm -hmm. gets together and build them a barn. So the idea, really is there's a kind of a social collective thing where we all pitch in to help people out. Um, so if people ask me what insurance is, really, there's two aspects. One is what we call risk transfer, which means that you as the policyholder or the insured are transferring risk to the insurance company, um, which protects you from unexpected losses. And then the other aspect is what we call risk pooling, which is that the insurance company will then take all this premium from all these different policyholders and put it in a big pot and use that to pay the losses. So what happens is that normally in most insurance situations, uh, only a few of the policyholders have a loss and most don't. So the people that don't that year end up subsidizing uh, the ones that do have a loss. So, you know, uh, from and it's, a, it's an annual kind of a pooling arrangement. It doesn't, it's so, Basically, those that don't have losses subsidize those that do. Right, and so, you know, it's, it, in a sense, it's like me paying into this pool over a period of a year or two, or mm. if I'm lucky, five or ten, mm. uh, and then at some point I'm going to need to use it, and I've got, I'll call it reserves, but I've got this contract that says they'll pay for whatever I need to have done up to certain limits. Right. Yeah, you know, and so it works good. In a, in, a, in a general sense, it works good, but then when you start getting into price fixing and, and determining prices that are going to be applicable. So, for example, if I'm really sick and you're not, I'm going to probably need to use that policy a lot more than you will. So is it fair that if we're the same age, we pay the same premium? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a philosophical question, I guess. But that's part of what the, some of the issues are that's going to have to be addressed uh, with some of the uh, the reform that's taking place today. Does that make sense? Right. So the what will happen is the insurance company will collect the premium or the fee from each insured to cover the costs, in this case, the underlying medical costs. So 
the premium prices are one thing and the costs that are paid are another thing. And when you look at rating st structures across the, the different kinds of insurance, um, you could go all the way to one side and have everybody pay the same rate, uh, in which case uh, some would say, well, that's not fair because that other guy has a bigger risk than I do. That guy's got a, a, a wood house when I have a masonry house. Um, but on the other side, or, or you can add some factors in there that will uh, individualize the rate a little bit, mm -hmm. such as the age or utilization. So, and there's a balance in there. You don't want it. You, you don't. You want to find a balance in there normally, and you don't want it to be too complicated. Right. It's got to be understood. You know, and right. people have to have a perceived value that they're mm -hmm. getting for this. Yeah. But it's a very complicated area. It's, it's an area that. Um, people wrestle with all the time. Uh, you know, and I think with the Obamacare, they're trying to simplify it, make it a little bit more transparent, uh, and maybe moving in the right direction, but it's still a fairly complicated area. And there's insurance companies out there that's losing a lot of money right now. Other insurance companies are making money. So there's somewhere there's gonna be a balance. Um, let's talk about costs a little bit, you know, and we've got a, a rising cost environment. We have had a rising cost environment in healthcare for many decades. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Why is that happening? Um, there are a lot of things that are driving uh, the costs. Um, one example is lifestyle. If I I'm overweight, and that's not helpful to the healthcare costs. Some people, uh, I don't, but some people, uh, you know, are, you know, they drink too much or smoke too much. So lifestyle plays a role, um, and public health um, plays a role, um, even outside of the delivery system. And then you have advances in technology. I mean, if all you can do is uh, give someone an aspirin, that's not going to cost very much, but if you have many new technologies uh, that may reduce the cost in some cases, in other cases it may increase the cost. But the more things you can do for somebody, the more things that are going to do. And then uh, there are some other things like uh, how you pay the physicians and hospitals can create uh, perverse incentives um, uh, and uh, um, things of that nature. Uh, there's a lot of different drivers, but some of those are the, the key drivers. Yeah, the, and you know, the aging population sure. uh, and the fact that people are living longer. Sure. You know, and I think it's, it's fair to say that the older you are, the more health care you're going to need. You know, I mean, in my case, parts just don't work as well as they used to and need to be either fixed or I'm more susceptible to colds or injury or whatever. So as the population gets older, you know, the costs will go up. And I think as, um, as, the, as you mentioned, the technology develops, um, that's helping us to live longer and that doesn't come cheap. But let, let's um, circle back on that for just a second. We're gonna have to take a, a one minute break and then we'll come back and we'll maybe have a couple more comments about the costs to drivers. Uh, and then we'll go into some other topics. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. I'm here today with Lloyd Lim. We're talking about uh, health healthcare issues. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about a couple other topics uh, right after this 60 second break. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii. Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. I didn't listen. Thank you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're here today with Lloyd Lim. We're talking about healthcare issues, uh, particularly in the insurance markets, and then also uh, some other topics uh, that will be of interest to you here shortly. Uh, Lloyd, we were just talking about some of the cost drivers. 
I think one of them that we didn't have a chance to talk about in addition to longevity and, and people living longer and, and some of the, the technology that's been developed that doesn't come cheap, um, there's also, I guess, a potential liability, um, whether it be malpractice or, or other types of liabilities in, in a hospital environment or whatever, um, that causes, I guess, practitioners to really do all the tests um, that might perceivably be needed instead of just the ones that they feel maybe are the most appropriate. And they do that in order to protect themselves a little bit. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. Um, it's been long documented that um, doctors who are afraid of getting sued uh, will practice what we call defensive medicine and do more than perhaps they need to do or indeed also if the uh, patient is requesting something, they don't feel uh, free to just say no. Mm -hmm. no. Well, because if, if there's a patient who, in theory, is supposed to know themselves better than anybody else, feels that there's something wrong, mm -hmm. and they are ignored, and then it comes to find out that, well, they were right, mm -hmm. then they got another problem. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so it's, you know, preservation, you know, defensive medicine, as you said, um, and all of these things together, you know, help drive up the costs, mm -hmm. and that's... Uh, not necessarily the uh, the fault of the insurance companies. It's just the, the industry itself uh, is moving in that direction, and um, and we benefit from it because we're living longer and better than we ever have before. So, you know, I, I don't like paying the, the high cost myself, but um, it's better than being sick or dead. Well, on that point, <clears throat> I had uh, spent uh, I I had done a. a uh, quite a number of coverage disputes between the insurance companies and patients in what we called an external review process. And um, it's an interesting contrast to the rates because when you're the regulator, uh, you hear a lot from people who don't want to pay the premium. And with well understood, it's extremely expensive. But when you get into the coverage dispute, um, people don't want to hear about, well, we're not going to pay for your, your medical care. Yeah. So you get, it depends on which hat you happen to be wearing. And so it looks a lot different when you're 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 sick and you you want care and someone's telling you no. So it's just that perspective that people should have. That's true. That's true. Um, from your experience that you've had in the industry for all these years, you know, and, and in a t today's environment, what do you think are the biggest challenges that we're going to be facing uh, in the near term? Um. You know, access to care is, is potentially one of the issues. Well, I would say that we still haven't agreed on a couple of things from a philosophical or ideological standpoint. As a country, um, some people think everybody should get care. Maybe not every care sh should be covered that way. Um, some people think it's a right. Some people don't. Um, we also have a, a big debate about the, the extent that government should be involved. Um, and so it's it's those kinds of, and, and also this whole issue about cost control, uh, there are good aspects to that and there are some trade-offs to that. And I don't know that we really had a, a fully blown discussion about what that impact could be on people. So I think it's some of the philosophical and partisan related debates that we haven't really shaken out yet that are the biggest challenge. And those are some of the tougher discussions that's gotta be had. They are, yes. You know, and uh, and that's something that may not have any clear-cut answers to. True. You know, and so it's going to be an interesting environment, I think, in the next few years uh, to see how this all kind of shakes out and, and falls into place. But I think one thing is is fairly sure is that we're probably going to continue to have uh, Medicare and Social Security. I mean, I've heard all these horror stories about how we're going to lose Social Security, we're going to lose and two different things, I know, but a lot of people, for whatever reason, combines the two. Uh, but Medicare is going to be there. I mean, it's going to be funded somehow. They're going to figure out a way to make it work. It's not going to go away. Um, and uh, Social Security is probably going to be there in some form or fashion. But the, the solutions to fixing these two issues are different. Right. Uh, and we're going to have to have those discussions, too. So it's, it's going to be an interesting few years. Um, you know, what do you, um, now that you're 
Is it fair to say you're retired now, or you're, I know you're busy. You're doing a lot of stuff. I am. Um, um, <clears throat> I uh, we do have an ethics restriction uh, in the government um, of a one-year moratorium on representing people before the the agency that we work for. And I don't know if I would do that, but I wanted to observe that. But I also had a number of family business uh, items and personal pet projects that I wanted to pursue. Um, and so uh, I've been rather busy doing that, uh, surprisingly so. I didn't think I'd be that busy, and for this long, but I have been. Well, how long has it been since you left the department? I left the department uh, officially on June 30th, 2016, so it's been almost a year. Okay. So you're, you're almost there, so that might open up some opportunities or options that you could take a look at you know, down sure. the road. Um, but you've uh, you've got the family businesses that you've been involved in, but you're also a, a writer too. You've been writing, I guess, in the past as well as presently. There's books that you've been working on. Can you just what are some, what are these books that you're you're writing? Well, I um, I was actually an English literature major, and so I do like to write, and so. Um, I've written a couple of books. I started out in 2010. Um, they're um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I've done some essays for uh, a local think tank. Um, but one of the reasons why I started writing is that um, because I was in government, I got to speak to the public pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. And I began to find out that um, people didn't know everything that they should know, at least on a basic level, even on a basic fundamentals level. Um, and in my own life, I found that for myself, too, that even though I've been through a lot of education and a lot of experience, I'm constantly learning things. So what I try to do is, uh, is teach what I think people need to know in an efficient way um, so they don't have to go through the pain that I went through learning these the hard way. That's sort of my right. objective. Save some people some pain. <laughs> or time, anyway. Yeah. Well, in, in one of the books, and I'm not sure if we can get a shot of this or not, but one of the books that you've been reading uh, or writing, and I'm going to be doing some reading on, is no more stupidity insights for the modern world. Now, what's um what's this book about? Okay, so um, it's actually no more stupid tree. It was a, a joke tree. on a, tr a play okay. on the strategery uh, thing. But oh, I, gotcha. um, I have a pretty extensive liberal arts background, uh, and uh, so what I thought was some folks. Maybe they're STEM, they have engineering science backgrounds, or perhaps some people don't get to go to college um, for a variety of reasons. And so I wanted to write a short book that would kind of fill that gap um, and uh, uh, also to remind teachers that of certain things that I thought were fundamental to teach that sometimes get missed. And so that was the idea behind the book. It's a kind of a training book, um, Cliff Notes to Western Civilization, you could say. That's where I was kind of going. I was trying to figure out exactly how to describe it. It's, it's cliff notes that covers a lot of different subjects and a lot of different topics that is, is I would think, helpful, um, healthy to have a, a lot of people have a better understanding on. And, and this kind of kind of dips your toe into the water a little bit and gives you an orientation to what right. those areas are. That's good. And how can people get this book if they wanted to take a look at it? Well, there may be a few copies left on the on Amazon, um, also or Barnes and Noble, and also uh, one can uh, contact me uh, directly. I'm locatable on the uh, internet by putting my name in there, so um, I, it, it can be gotten for me directly. Okay, so just typing in a, a search for Lloyd Lim. Uh, uh, Lloyd Lim Hawaii. Lloyd Lim Hawaii. There are Hawaii. quite a few uh, Lloyd Lims out there. Um, but Lloyd Lim Hawaii, there's only two here in Honolulu or Hawaii. All right, and and you're the one with the book, so right, they'll be able to find you. Very good. And is there any particular area in here? And I know that I, I'm looking at the contents, and there's a it's very broad. There's a lot of different things. Is there anyone in here that you would uh, uh, think is is more important than any of the others, or w what's your thoughts about some of the content here? Um, I'm not sure. Well, there there are probably two things that matter more than others. One, I sort of address the larger question of the role of government in the economy, um, which is really at the core of our political issues, mm -hmm. large, a lot of our issues today. And another one, I, I sort of talk about science. A lot of people don't know that um, there is actually a whole area of study that is the philosophy of science, and that it's not as simple as we're taught uh, through textbooks. 
And so I tried to make that very simple and, and, and also raise the question of what is the difference between correlation and causation? Because it's very easy when you live in a complex society and a complex economy to think things are causing a problem when something else is actually causing it. So um, I think those are probably some of the more important uh, things in there. You know, and, and I'm just kind of going through it. I'm looking at some things, you know, and it jumps out, you know, intelligence and education, what is an American, law pointers, technology and politics, race and culture. I mean, it's, there's a, a very broad, I mean, this is a, a, a good, I guess, summary of some of the bigger issues that are going on in the world that uh, people can just kind of take a look at and get a little orientated with. That's very interesting. You know, are you working on any other uh, books or, or anything? Or? I'm, uh, uh, I should have another book coming out this year, 2017, which is a business book, which I've tried to be very concise and yet give people a broad range of, uh, 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 to cover what many other books would cover, and also to give some practical uh, training tips, which makes it more uh, practical than most books are. Um, and my objective is that, you know, as the market changes and more people uh, aren't going to be relying on staff jobs and staff employee jobs, but will be independent contractors, entrepreneurs, uh, mm -hmm. what I call economic vagabonds, they're going to need something to prep them. And they probably don't want to spend, you know, a huge amount of money on business right. school or a little time, really. So I wanted to create something for that purpose um, and hopefully make it a kind of a one book. Uh, training training mechanism. Super. Now we got about you know forty five seconds left, so we we don't have much time. But I know you know, and and your skill set is amazing. I mean, you're also a a skilled musician, and you you've gotten into the music world, and and you're a big supporter of the symphony. I mean, was it? My gosh, I mean, there's a lot that you can talk about there too. Yeah, I I play the piano. I have a long standing interest in music. Um, I did want to say a few words about the Hawaii Symphony because they are a very good orchestra today in a way that they weren't in the past. Um, but a lot of people also don't know that even a, a top orchestra like the Berlin Philharmonic can't rely solely on ticket sales. They must also get support from businesses. For example, the Berlin Philharmonic is underwritten largely by Deutsche Bank and the city of Berlin. It's not really ticket sales. Um, and I could say a number of things about um, the symphony, but one should, uh, the one thing I would like to say is that the musicians of the symphony are also, typically almost all of them at least, are teachers. Mm -hmm. And they teach the, our students. And there's a big difference when you're a teacher of music, if you have the opportunity to play for a really top orchestra, a very fine orchestra like the Hawaii Symphony, because it keeps your skills up, it keeps your, uh, you, you, you keep in the music in a way that a teacher that doesn't have that. So these benefits go beyond merely listening to a concert, and that's why one of the reasons why I think supporting it's a good idea. All right, so let's support the symphony, and I'm sure that they have a website that they can do a search and find in and show you all the different ways that they HSO, can. HSO, definitely. Yes. HSO, all right, very good. Well, Lloyd, it was great to have you on the show. We'll have to do a follow-up one time and talk some more about some of these uh, these broad range of topics that you've uh, gotten into. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Uh, our topics are success stories in Hawaii uh, or the organizations and the people that make that happen. So until next week, aloha.